Okay, we are live. Uh, so for those listening at home, welcome to the Live from Sword Coast podcast. My name is Kevin Madison, uh, and I'm actually not going to be your friendly dungeon master uh, this evening. I guess technically at the time of recording, I will be uh, in a couple of hours. Um, I have my regular scheduled D&D game tonight, uh, but um, I purchased uh, something uh, yesterday that I've had a, uh, I've been waiting for for quite some time, and I dove into it quite heavily last night and today, and I wanted to um, give my two cents uh, for uh, folks who may be thinking of purchasing this as well. And that product is the uh, Genesis uh, role-playing game, uh, now published by uh, Fantasy Flight uh, Games. Um, at the time of recording, uh, December 1st, uh, this came out yesterday, so this is, is quite new. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give a brief overview of what's in the book um, and what my sort of take on uh, on the book is. I don't do a lot of reviews here uh, only because there, there's just a ton of reviews that are you know uh, available online. Um, this particular game, though, I really have been looking forward to this, and I was... I mean, the, to cut to the chase, I was really disappointed with what I actually got here. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, as context, I suppose, I should say, like, I am a very, very loyal uh, Fantasy Flight uh, customer. As you can see on my shelf here, uh, anything that's been published for the Star Wars games I have so far, I've got a full collection of the uh, um, uh, Deathwing, uh, or Deathwing, is that what it's called? Death, what? Death Watch uh, role-playing game, uh, as well as core books for all their um, uh, Warhammer 40k games. Uh, got a couple of their board games as well. I, I really have really, really enjoyed uh, their their games to date. Uh, in particular, the Star Wars games. The Star Wars games are the best version of a Star Wars role-playing game that I've encountered. I, I ran the game for um, about a year and a half uh, before we took a hiatus from it, and uh, it was a terrific, fun and uh, and different experience. So um, that's the context with which uh, you should take my my comments here. Um, I'm not coming into this as someone necessarily with an axe to grind. I'm someone who really did want to enjoy this game, and I'm going to try and give a balanced assessment. But I just mm, boy, this was really uh, I, I really had expected more of uh, of this game. Um, so let's talk about why, what the game is actually and what you get out of it. So as a, um, uh, maybe as a, a little visual guide here, you can see that there is this interesting visual style that they've elected to take on this, where there's a completed, uh, picture of sort of a multi-genre, you know, setting here. But then as you get closer to the edges, it, the artwork is less finished. It's more in a draftsman stage. That style has been adopted for almost the entire rulebook, uh, such that you can see here. There's this, you know, duochrome uh, style here with the construction lines still in it. That is adopted through almost the entire book, um, and it is an interesting visual tick uh, or, or style they've taken. But to be honest, like for a game published in 2017 like this is super subpar this isn't acceptable for for a game in in today's day and age like as i was flipping through this what i was reminded of is the alternative role playing game that was published by tsr back in the in the late 90s because it had almost the exact same uh, color scheme the same sort of approach now obviously the art is not the be all and end all of a role playing game but as an initial impression one of the things i looked forward to was flipping through here and seeing all the cool art as they've had in all their Star Wars games. Their Star Wars books are beautiful, full color, gorgeous illustrations, all painting, no uh, line illustrations in it. This is almost all line illustrations though. Um, there are some uh, near the back of the book where they talk about their uh, sample settings. There are some uh, um, painted full color uh, pieces that are taken directly from their other intellectual properties. Uh, but for the most part, it's all just this blue and orange uh, you know, monochrome or a, a duochromatic um, il line illustrations, and it's just like even the paper. And I could be wrong about this, but the paper feels to be a, of a lesser quality than what the uh, um, the the published, uh, or rather than what the um, uh, the Star Wars role playing games have. So here's I think my best example of this. Like here's this half finished uh, dragon drawing where it's still in a sketch stage with just a little bit of tightening up on it. 
again, like the drawings aren't the be all and end all, or the illustrations are the be all and end all of the game, but like that in a nutshell is. I, I think I expect there are going to be a lot of reviewers who will be using that as the go-to joke that, you know, you want to understand what this game is. You look at the illustration. It's just not finished. Um, so, um, and I guess one other just little criticism that I'll get out of the way. So if you are contemplating getting this and in, in light of whatever I have to say about this or other people have to say, you still want to pick it up. Um, I foolishly went out and because the internet was not decided yet as to whether or not these were the same dice as in the Star Wars games, I got three sets of, of dice because I wanted to make sure that I had all the dice I needed for it. I understood that they were pretty much the same, but there wasn't anything clear from the publisher that this was the same dice. In the sense that there were the same number of symbols on all the sides because the dice mechanic in this game is based very heavily on the proprietary dice mechanic in Star Wars. It turns out they're the same fucking dice. They're exactly the same. They have different icons on them, but the icons are in the same place that the corresponding ones are for Star Wars. So to not have put a somewhere to indicate that, look, if you've got dice for Star Wars already, you don't need this for this. Um, that may very well have been published somewhere. So if, if someone wants to correct me on that, then please do. But I was pretty active and searching online for early reviews and early information about this, and I couldn't find it. So it could be that my um, Google foo is uh, is deficient, but um, that kind of hacked me off. So I've got a bunch of they're they're lovely dice, and I'm I'm sure if I run the game, uh, or I shouldn't say if when I run the game, um, I'll make use of them. But it just pissed me off that they didn't make clear, you know that. Uh, I didn't need to pick up another three sets of dice of things I already have. So um, let's talk about what's the, what's in the actual game. So the game is is built on the front as the role playing game for all settings. And what this is is uh, uh, the way it was marketed beforehand was as Fantasy Flight's uh, entrance into sort of the generic uh, role playing game uh, system or center. So um, the sort of mm, uh, field, I guess, that it would be entering into would be for games like Savage Worlds, uh, that is a similar uh, multi-genre kind of game, GURPS, uh, and oh, Cypher, the Cypher system. Um, it also, I do have a copy of the uh, Fate book around here somewhere too, but I actually don't know that system well enough and I, I, I keep bouncing off of it. So I understand Fate's another um, multi-genre game that you could go into, but um, that's the market that they're going for with this. This is supposed to be something that's going to be held up against um, other generic role-playing systems, things you can pick up and tell whatever stories you want with them uh, or tell you know a bunch of different types of stories but always have the same underlying core mechanic. That's what Savage Worlds, GURPS, Cypher, and Fate all do. Um, so the underlying mechanic in this is uh, a... a uh, mechanic that uses proprietary dice. There are different colored dice, as you can see in here. Um, your uh, dice, it uses dice pools where you assemble both the uh, positive and negative um, factors into one dice pool. So you will have uh, green dice, which are sort of like lesser versions of good dice. Uh, yellow dice, which are greater versions of uh, uh, good dice. Uh, Purple dice, which are your lesser versions of challenge dice or like bad dice. Um, red dice, which are your more uh, significant versions of bad uh, dice. And then there are situational modifier dices, or die, I should say, dices, Jesus. Um, blue is good, black is bad. So your dice pool will be made up of a number of different types of proprietary dice. The results uh, on the um, sides of the dice are different symbols, uh, successes, failures, uh, advantages and disadvantages. Now, they may not call that that in um, Genesis, but that's what it was uh, in, in the previous. I think it was hits and misses. Anyway, it's it's uh, what you do is you roll your dice, you look how many of the symbols you've got, you, can, you have them cancel out, and your net result is what your dice pool will look like. And the really interesting thing with the dice pool mechanic is that, for one, there's no numbers, uh, so you're just looking at symbols and figuring out how many of them you have. Uh, so it it um, it takes a bit of the mathiness out of uh, role-playing games that you, you find in other games. And what it also does is because there is uh, advantage and disadvantage as well as like success or failure, you have an interesting dynamic in the in the dice mechanic where you can have like a success but with some uh, failure, some some bad things that have happened, you know. Or you could have a an example that they use in the Star Wars games is say like if you succeed with uh, a bunch of disadvantage 
uh, on a, you're hacking a, um, a computer system. Well, maybe you succeeded in hacking the computer system, but the disadvantage means that someone heard, or you know, you've you've activated a um, an alarm somewhere, so that the next time you try something, it's going to be more difficult. And similarly, there's the reverse, where like you fail, but you set yourself up for something good. Uh, and that interesting sort of like four or two axes uh, approach to uh, success and failing means makes for really interesting stuff at the table. It's really fun. Uh, it's also fun to try and interpret what the the good and bad results are. You also have extremes where you have in in the Star Wars games it was uh, triumph and despair, where you would have something amazingly great happen or something really bad happen, and that also made for a lot of really fun, kind of oracular emergent storytelling moments at at the table. Um, so the underlying mechanic in in Genesis is the exact same mechanic. It's the same thing that was in uh, the Star Wars role playing games, the uh, Edge of the Empire. Uh, Age of Rebellion and Force and Destiny. That has not changed. Um, the first chunk of the book uh, it gives you an introduction as to um, you know the dice mechanics. Uh, they have replaced uh, from Star Wars the um, there's no Force die in this, uh, nor are there uh, Destiny points, which were used in the light side dark side kind of thing to, to as dice modifiers for either the DM or for the players. Uh, they've replaced it with something called story points, which are a little more flexible uh, than what the uh, uh, the other dice were, uh, or sorry, the other points were used. But it's very similar to like if you know Benny's in Savage Worlds, or you know action points in like every game that calls them action points or feat points in in Iron Kingdoms. Uh, that's what you're using them for. You're using them for um, uh, fortune, I guess, in um, Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, you're you're using those things to, to modify your dice rolls, to mitigate the vagaries of, uh, of the dice. Uh, so that's not, un, you know, if you're familiar with the Star Wars um, uh, use of light side, dark side points, you're, you're going to know what the, you know, what these are used for. Uh, same attributes. It's uh, six attributes, I believe, or six characteristics uh, that are uh, used in this. Um, one way this differs from the Star Wars game is that you pick either uh, an archetype or a species, depending on what your setting's going to be. And what it is is very, again, very similar to uh, Star Wars, where it gives you a set amount of um, a starting point for what your attributes are, usually a skill bonus, and then maybe some other kind of uh, intrinsic bonus as well that comes from either your archetype or your species. Uh, now, archetypes are something new for this, uh, but uh, there's only four of them. Um, and whether you have your basic average human, which is a two in every one of the uh, six abilities, um, and nothing particularly special about them. And then you can have someone like a laborer who's uh, slightly stronger, but a little less willful, uh, an intellectual who's smarter, but not as agile, or an aristocrat who is um, has more charisma or physical pre or, um, presence, I suppose, um, but is not as uh, strong or fit. Um, each of the archetypes has the the each of the three archetypes, sorry, four archetypes has a special ability as well, which is something new. Um, and it's a neat way of distinguishing, I guess, giving another axis on the character creation other than just being like you're all human. If you're playing in a modern day setting, you're not just all starting at human. You could have someone who's a laborer, someone who's an intellectual, someone who's a um, aristocrat. Um, the careers are a little different from Star Wars as well. In Star Wars, you picked a career, it gave you a, a listed set of what your uh, career uh, skills were, and then you picked a certain amount of points worth of those skills, and then you were given a specialty, and you picked a couple more skills based on your specialty. Uh, now you just got a career, and the careers you can create on your own, but they do give a, a decent selection of what the careers would be like. Uh, so it's things like, you know, uh, tradesperson, um, a leader, a scoundrel, an explorer, and then more setting specific things like a knight or a mad scientist or a starship captain. Uh, Druid is actually one of the ones uh, listed here too. Um, so that's kind of neat. You, you, that, your selection of career gives you certain, uh, you make a list of your skills or your, yeah, the, the skills that are your career skills. Those are cheaper for you to develop as you develop your character. Uh, and um, and then the other, uh, you get a certain amount of points based on your, um, you know, that you can invest in your career points. Um, just like in the Star Wars games, you're also given a, a starting budget of experience points that you can spend to uh, to advance your abilities, to advance your skills, and so forth. Um, the thing is, is that just like in Star Wars, one problem is, is that because um, advancing your um, abilities is a lot harder once you're actually in play, there's still no reason to not just dump almost all of your experience points into your abilities, your, your attributes, get those up higher, 
and then just buy skills and stuff later on in the course of, of uh, play. So um, that was one thing I noticed with um, running Star Wars for a while is that players would just, you'd have characters who had good uh, attributes to start with, but kind of minimal amounts of investment in skills and talents. Uh, talents are uh, this version, the, sort of the um, Star Wars sort of equivalent of like feats in uh, in Dungeons and Dragons and, and other types of games, Pathfinder. Th little thing, abilities you can do that aren't necessarily skill related uh, that uh, distinguish your character from other characters. Um, Genesis has gotten away from the talent tree um, kind of thing that they had in uh, Star Wars. In Star Wars, uh, each character uh, specialty had a talent tree, and it was a little map. You had to like a, a you know decision tree kind of thing. You had to go through and buy your talents in specific orders, uh, rather than uh, than following that route. What they've done now is just set them up as specific tiers, and uh, there's a informal rule where you have to have twice. You have to have more. Uh, talents in the level below you before you can get one above you. So that means you have to have two level one talents before you can buy a level two talent. And you have to have two level two talents and three level one talents before you can buy a level three talent. So um, the talents is where it starts to get a little... Mm, um, there are some role-playing uh, elements that, that they introduce in this game too that weren't in Star Wars, at least not in the core books, um, where you're picking a desire a sphere, a strength, and a flaw for your character. They had similar uh, elements in all three of the Star Wars games, but they didn't necessarily come into play. Uh, in this game, they've introduced a more complicated social interaction set of rules that uh, I think I saw in one of the Star Wars products. That I, I can't remember and haven't actually looked it up yet, but I think it may be just duplicating what was there. But it's an interesting way of, of adding some gaminess to the social interaction stuff. Um, but in any event, the next thing you um, uh, you pick is your gear, uh, your appearance, your skills, and uh, sorry, the talents. Emmy, what are you doing? Sorry, my dog is uh, curious. So the talents are, are one of the first places where I feel like there's a little bit of um, of lackluster uh, effort in here. The what they've got is there's a decent selection of the talents um, that are in here, and there's a, a few that really stand out, that give you different things that your character can do that no one else can do. But an awful lot of them are just, you know, you get an extra blue dice or you take away two black dice. Um, and, or there are ways that you can spend strain. Like that, that, those are actually neat. Like the dodge and parry abilities are ways that you can mitigate damage in the game. And this game is, uh, the system is, is a type where you probably are going to get hit. You know, like, it, this is not a game that really lends itself towards, or a system, I should say, that lends itself towards really dodgy-type characters. You're probably going to get hit, and you're probably going to take damage. So the way they manage that is you take... Uh, there's two different sort of types of damage you can take. Strain is just non-permanent, um, temporary um, uh, damage, I guess, or, like, fatigue. And you can recover that much quicker than you can your, your actual wounds. Uh, so you can spend strain to mitigate wounds through those things. But most of the other ones are just really slight dice modification, uh, like uh, dice modifiers. They they modify your dice pool in very very small ways. They're nothing that it's nothing that really gives you a very specific unique ability of like boy now I can do X and no one else can do that. Um, there are a couple of those in here, um, like animal companion, which is kind of neat. Um, there is uh, mad scientist or mad inventor, uh, they call it which is a, allows you once per session to create, you know, cobble together some kind of um, nifty looking, you know, magic or not magic, um, mad, uh, crazy device uh, in a MacGyver kind of way. But there's nothing particularly supernatural in any of them. There's nothing, you know, like that you would expect if you wanted to run like a, um, uh, you know, D&D style fantasy type thing. There's no suggestions of how to do animal form or like lay on hands or detect magic even or things like that. So the the book, the core book itself um, does not give you any examples of how to cost that kind of thing. There are suggestions and advice that is uh, found later in the book as to how to put those kind of things together. But at the end of it, I don't find that it's particularly helpful advice because it doesn't have a lot of samples. It doesn't really give you like, well, here's how you would cost out this unusual type of ability for your type of setting. Like if you wanted to run a modern 
like urban arcana thing. Um, I have no idea how you'd cost out someone being a werewolf. I suppose you would build it as a species, but that's kind of weird because if you're a human who becomes infected, I don't know, if you become a vampire, a vampire's not a, it would be a species you would have to try to build that way. Uh, it's not a talent you'd get. Um, you, there's just some things that just feel like they should be talents. Uh, you know, some supernatural abilities that should be able to be built as talents and they've given you no guidance as to how to do that in here. So to me, that, that means that it's um, at least for picking up and playing with it, there's limited utility for if you want to run anything other than a very bare bones, non, you know, no supernatural kind of uh, setting. I'll talk about skills in, or spells, I should say, in a little bit. Spells is sort of their power system in this, but um, but anyway, that's that's the way that the talents are um, are put together. Uh, there's there's certainly enough in here. Uh, setting aside my my comments uh, with respect to like emulating a, a certain genre of play, if you're running a modern day thing with no special you know, magical crap in it. Like if you're running Die Hard, right? You want to run a, it's Christmas time, time for a Christmas, you know, session playing John McClane or a John McClane type character taken by hostages and or taken by, you know, uh, terrorists. Uh, you, there's plenty of options you can have for building your different types of characters in that type of environment. Um, there's very minimal rules on encumbrance and, and uh, um, gear uh, in the next section. For items, they adopt many of the same uh, elements that they had in uh, Star Wars, which is to say that there were different qualities that items can have, and then that gives you access to sort of new sub-rules you can use with it. I love that in Star Wars. Uh, I think it's a, a great mechanic, uh, and in particular because a lot of it takes advantage of the advantage and um, disadvantage uh, mechanic in your dice pool. So when you're rolling, uh, whether you succeed or fail, uh, that just deter in combat, that determines how much damage you would do. Uh, if you hit, every extra hit does more damage, but it's your advantage that you roll, um, the, uh, the the stuff that comes from the, the good dice. Uh, that's what dictates whether you can trigger some of your item's special abilities. So things like auto fire with a, a fully automatic weapon or stun or uh, homing for uh, if you've got a homing torpedo or something like that. It's a great feature and they have carried it over into this and they, and they do, it looks like uh, they've included all, uh, all of the same qualities they did in Star Wars. So that's good. So that's a good baseline um, uh, set of rules to, to create your, your unique things from. Uh, in the core book section, there's almost nothing in the way of weapons. They offer two weapon descriptions, a knife and a revolver. That's not to say those are the only ones in the book, but they've tucked everything else back in their sample sections. And that just seems unnecessary uh, like just keep it all in one place and say you know have a little marker on there of what setting it can it can be in but whatever the armor is the same way too they have an example of an armor but they um all the specifics for each type of setting is found later in in the book uh combat encounters work exactly the same way they do in star wars so if uh, if you are familiar with that uh, you'll be familiar with this uh, the initiative system seems to be the same as well you make which is a good system i, I like it a lot because you uh, you make your rolls, you set slots for initiative based on how, how everyone did, and then anyone can fill any one of those roles. So uh, characters who need to get something done to help everyone else, you know, to give a buff to everyone else or to set any, someone else up, they're able to go first. Not They're not, you know, uh, subject to the shitty initiative role that they happen to roll. They can always have the fast guy go first or, or whatever. So I like that a lot. Um, as I said, there's a new section on uh, social encounters and the, the way that this differs from the Star Wars ones, from the core books at least, is they give you a, a bunch of um, examples of what you can spend your uh, advantage and disadvantage uh, on to uh, to modify a social encounter. Uh, I like that an awful lot because I think that that will give some good cues for role playing through your uh, social encounter. Uh, when I go back to running Star Wars again, because I'm sure I'm going to, I will absolutely steal these rules. Although again, like these actually, I feel like these have been in one of or two of the Star Wars books already. So um, it may just be that I had uh, I was not paying close enough attention uh, to when they came out. Um, the nice thing I like about having that as well too, I know that there's there's a you know people are of two minds I think of whether gamifying role playing encounters is worthwhile um, because you don't want to just make you know social hit points or something like that. But for a game like this, where the dice mechanic does lend itself to lots of narrative improvisation, that makes for really fun 
social encounters. You know, if someone is amazing at uh, you know social uh, their social skills, and you happen to roll a really great uh, result, but then they also happen to roll a um, a despair, which is like the the critical failure. That makes for really fun stuff for everybody at the table because everyone does that collective like oh no you know and uh uh and also it, it gives it makes it fun for the dm because suddenly you have to come up with uh something on the fly of well what the hell does this mean like you you did succeed but what's the really bad thing that happens you know um so i i really like that i, I i'm glad that they've uh, incorporated that into the social mechanics as well and i'm sure if, if you feel that you know gamifying the social stuff is uh, is not something you want to do it's an easily jettisoned portion of the game um, they give a little bit of description uh, on the different types of uh, of adversaries you'll fight in the Star Wars games, uh, like a lot of other games like um, uh, Feng Shui and Dungeons and Dragons Fourth Edition. Uh, there are you know minions. Um, uh, what do they call them? Uh, minions, rivals, and nemeses. Nemeses are sort of supposed to be the equivalent or a little better than player characters. Uh, rivals are equivalent sort of but a little weaker and not quite as capable uh, than player characters and then minions are just the stormtroopers they're the the people by the buttload that you just mow your way through who all attack as one uh, those are terrific rules in star wars they make for really fun and exciting combats um, you can have a you know an encounter with just tons of, of minions and it's a challenging encounter still uh, in particular with the you know advantage disadvantage aspect throwing wrenches in the pl plans of players um, and the Nemesis rules, they've also adopted um, the adversary mechanic, which they had before. And that's kind of a way of, of dialing the difficulty uh, of the encounter, is modifying the system. Now, there are not many ways that the Star Wars game encourages the DM to screw with the system itself. Uh, the adversary rule is one of the few ways where you're adding to the difficulty of uh, a player's task simply because of the vert of how tough this target is that they're trying to go against. The reason I want to mention that is because this game has been out, I believe it was 2012, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm making this too early, but uh, the game, the Star Wars games have been out since I at least three or four years. So it's uh, three or four years they've had this system. That seems to be the biggest innovation that they've come up with. So in, in all the products that they've put out, in all the new things, that's the most um, that's the most you know creative application of the whole screwing with the dice mechanic itself to have a different effect at the table that they've come up with. And that's one of my major criticisms of this is because, uh, and I guess I'll get into it a little uh, a little later, but for every other multi-genre uh, role-playing game, there are all sorts of mechanical dials and knobs and stuff you can turn to make the game play like what you're trying to go for. For instance, if you want a more street-level, brutal, like playing, you know, like Law & Order type cops, you know, where like a bullet will really hurt you and whatnot, uh, almost every other uh, generic role-playing game, you know, I, I left out Hero System out of my, my list as well, but I, I, that's another generic uh, system um, that I'm familiar with. Almost all the other games I, I listed at the outset here, Savage Worlds, GURPS, uh, Cypher System, and Hero System, there are ways to do that to make it much more lethal and much more gritty and street level. Or alternatively, to dial it up and, and allow you to have the cartoonish violence that you have in superhero uh, encounters or superhero uh, you know, uh, things. That's not to say that every single one of these generic systems is as successful as modeling that as others. Uh, I think Hero System and Savage Worlds do supers really, really well without uh, without much modification. GURPS, you can do it, but it's really fucking hard, and you do have to sort of bend the system into pretzels to make it work properly to emulate super heroic combat. And Cypher, I don't think it does it very well, but I haven't had enough experience running it as a supers game, so I, I don't want to hit that up. So with that in mind, like that's how other generic systems are able to dial up, dial down the, or you know, alter the the fundamental mechanic in their game to make it work uh, thematically for other settings and and mechanically for other types of settings or genres. This does not offer any such suggestions. There's very minor suggestions for altering what's called the tone uh, of the thing of um, of each of your campaigns, which is different from the setting. But the tone modifications usually relate to how you spend your story points. There's nothing to do with the actual dice mechanic. Um, they include in the 
in, in the tone section, uh, superheroes as one. And I'm a big superhero fan. I, I love comics and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I've, you know, I've owned almost every superhero role-playing game because I love seeing new ways of, of interpreting it. They include supers in this as a tone, and it's just, honestly, it's a joke. Because the o- the extent of the dice modification or the 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 suggestions for how to emulate that are, boy, people hit really hard in, in combat, so you should double your brawn when you do hand-to-hand damage, and you should let one type of your dice explode. And, and if you're not familiar with the Savage Worlds or like 7C I, concept of exploding dice, you roll the maximum, so you roll a triumph, the best you can on your yellow dice, you get to roll it again and get another one. Thing is, is a yellow dice is a 12-sided dice, which means it's one in 12 chance of that coming up. So it's really not gonna come up that often. This isn't like a six-sided dice where, you know, there's 15% chance of, of it triggering or thereabouts, you know, 16%, I guess, or 17. Um, so it's very rare that that's ever gonna happen. And just as a casual observer in, of the game and having run the game for a while, like. The easiest way for me to think of how to model this is just say, look, look, you know, um, for super attributes, if you want to do super strong, super fast, super smart, or whatever else, give automatic successes. You know, have your your certain attributes have automatic hits on it. That doesn't mean you're always going to succeed because your dice pool will always be made up of bad dice as well as good dice, but it means that your results are almost always going to be positive. That's just an example of something I, you know, thought about while I was walking the dog uh, earlier as an example of what could have been done, but that's not in here, you know, and uh, I don't want to fault the game too much for, you know, not coming up with whatever other kind of innovations that that I might be able to do, but, you know, when the game holds itself out as a generic game that can be used for any setting, it should include rules to tweak that fundamental mechanic the dice rolling mechanics so that it'll be able to suit those things, not just add like, hey, here's another uh, challenge that you, you will encounter, which is fear because we hear some horror tone rules. So, um, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So let's talk about the, the still the good stuff. The adversary rules are, are quite good, um, but they're very, very brief. Uh, and you're only given a couple of, adva- of examples. The game is flexible enough and it improvs incredibly well. So just because you've got only a couple of examples in here does not mean you couldn't run a satisfying uh, session or two out of it, but it, it doesn't give you an awful lot of guidance as to how to develop other adversaries. It just gives you a very small handful. Now, uh, um, one response I've seen online to the, the criticism of how few adversaries are in the book is to say, well, you do a, you know you have all the Star Wars books that have adversaries in them. And if you do a Google search, there's a free PDF with a bunch of adversaries in it too. That's all good and fine. And I mean, I, I agree with that, but then that's fine. That's if you're going to make, uh, if you're going to buy the book and you're going to make use of it, make sure you take advantage of that because other examples will help you. However, the product is supposed to stand on its own though. It's, and, and there's no reference to finding other stuff online in here either. So it should have had better guidance in the actual book. It shouldn't rely on the internet to fill in the gaps in it. Um, The next major setting or major section of the book deals with the different settings. Uh, And that's like a lot of, you know, a a lot of uh, generic role-playing games, they they do that. Then they'll tell you, hey, here's how you can use these rules to do fantasy or to do science fiction or to do superheroes or to do pulp heroes or to do, you know, modern day mystery or or any weird combination of those you might want to you know, uh, glom together. That's the fun thing with these um, multi-genre or, or uh, generic uh, role-playing games is you can put together the weird combos you want. I want to run a superheroes in the old west being invaded by aliens thing. Done. I could do that in Savage Worlds. I can do that in in uh, GURPS. Uh, I can do that in Cypher uh, with very little uh, effort to try. I can do that in Hero uh, with very little effort to try and you know, tweak the rules or whatever else. And I suppose, and I would also have the option for those games to tweak the rules to make it more lethal or less lethal or however I want. If I want to have like an Unforgiven style thing where it's aging superheroes in the old West fighting aliens and they're dying by the tons, I give all sorts of rules to ratchet up the lethality of combat. Um, For the examples in the settings here, uh, or in the settings chapter, you have fantasy, you have steampunk, you have weird war, you have modern day, you have science fiction, which is really more like near future cyberpunk kind of stuff. So it's anything from like uh, William Gibson ish kind of like hacking and decking kind of stuff up to about like say the TV show or the book, the novel series, The Expanse, where it's near future ish. Um, that's covered in science fiction. And then there, the final chapter is space opera, which is you know the game system was originally designed to emulate Star Wars, which is a very space opera. So. 
that's in there. Each of these sections has, I believe it's 10 pages. So each of those settings has 10 pages. The unfortunate thing is because of the limited page count in this book, the book is only 253 pages long, including a four page um, uh, index and some character sheets. Uh, each setting only gets 10 pages. And of those 10 pages, usually four of those is chewed up just talking about the tropes in general. Things like, you know, magic is a defining characteristic in fantasy and monsters are a defining you know, thing in fantasy. But because those sections are so small, I'm not in a, in a generic game, you, it's good to have that kind of discussion, but to do those discussions justice, you normally need a lot more room. Like there's a reason that most generic role-playing games devote whole splat books or supplemental books to those uh, ideas because you know, what is fantasy is a huge topic for a generic role-playing game to tackle. So as such, their inclusion of this section just seems like a bit of a waste of time, and, and there's not much in here that you've not already read a hundred times before. Now, I can appreciate that everyone, you know, every game can, can be a new role-playing game to someone else, but I don't think that even a new DM would find the, the stuff in here particularly helpful. Um, in particular, there's no mechanical uh, suggest. Let me rephrase that. There is limited mechanical suggestions for how to change the system to fit your whatever theme they're trying to go for, setting they're trying to go for. So, for instance, in the fantasy section, you're given stats for elves, dwarves, and orcs. Uh, you are given some setting specific gear, which is like maybe twelve fantasy weapons. Um, and then you're given five types of fantasy armor. Now, one of the things that became apparent in the course of going through this is that most of the armor in every one of the settings is pretty much the same. They have almost the exact same stats. Now, the reason for that is, is because, uh, because the game, you take a lot of damage, as I said, uh, armor can't get too high because if you, the, your when you do damage to someone, you subtract your soak, and your soak is equal to your bronze stat, which is between one and five, uh, and then plus your armor. And then absent any other factors like armor piercing or whatever else, that's how much you subtract from the attack. An average attack's around about six or seven-ish, uh, and then you'll you know maybe add one or two to that for the successes. So if you combine those together, the average bronze is gonna be about two or three, your average armor is gonna be one or two, so it gives you a range of about between three and five for your soak. Um, if you're a more brawny, you know, melee type character, you're probably gonna have a higher soak. Uh, but your, uh, that's the range of soak you would normally be going for. And with an average damage of, um, uh, what did I say? Six to seven plus one or two successes, it gives you a range of seven to nine of damage. Subtract that. It means you're taking about four points of damage each, uh, uh each time you're hit. Um, they can't adjust the soak that much on the armor like there's the range of of armor um armor soak scores in this which again adds to the amount you subtract from the damage is between one and four that's for all of the settings so that means that your plate mail armor fundamentally has the same mechanics as what like stormtrooper armor does or what you know tactical armor in a modern setting would have now that's not necessarily a problem for me because, um, you know, I'm very much of the mind that you fit the, you know, you fit the, the parameters you need are for whatever your setting is. If your setting only has, you know, cloth armor up to plate mail armor, well, then that's the range you need to concern yourself with. You, you don't need to care about what, you know, uh, composite ceramic armor, you know, is in that setting because it's never going to show up anyway. But what it effectively means is that almost all the armor in almost all the settings, apart from the special features that you can add to them, they're the same mechanically. You know, a, a crossbow or a longbow is the same as an auto rifle. The only difference is, and I mean that literally, like literally the mechanics are identical except for the quality on it. Um, and like that is a meaningful difference, I suppose, but it really means that there's not an awful lot of difference between a lot of the different mechanical things that are included in here. It's cool that they've given you like, hey, here's what plate mail's like, here's what whatever's like but I would have sooner seen a high level uh, comment on it of like, look, here's the thing is that if your setting is never going to have whatever, you know, range, uh, you're not going to have the composite plate or power armor or whatever, then you pick your range that you're going to, uh, of armors available, and then you fit what thematically fits in your setting within that range. 
uh, that to me would have been a more productive, uh, you know, discussion in this book than uh, than what they did, which is just duplicate the stats and call it a different thing on different pages. Um, the fantasy section ends with a couple of uh, sample uh, uh, adversaries, and the adversaries they've included are Beastman, Razorwing, Skeleton, Bane, Spider, and Ogre. There's no dragon. You know, there's no dragon. There's no big scary monster in here to, to rescale for this. The biggest, scariest thing is an ogre in here. You know, I take a griffin. I take a hippogriff. I take a, you know, some, a hydra. You know, something that is an iconic, big, tough monster that I would want to see. But whatever. I mean, like, they, you know, there's only so much space they can fit in here. Um, the big thing that I, I find lacking from here is sample uh, talents. You know, what does a druid wild form look like? What does a familiar look like? What is a, uh, um, you know, if you want to add any kind of like, um, you know, animus style magic for a ranger, what does that look like? You know, and, and those are all sort of D&D informed ideas, but what are, you know, you could draw from other types of, uh, you know, things. What does packed magic look like? You know, if I want to have a um, Howardian kind of Conan type setting. Um, it would have been really helpful to have a couple of those in here to tell me what the the talents, the things that distinguish my character from some other character, what those might look like in each of these settings. Now, my complaints about the the uh, fantasy setting carries over for the rest of the settings too. So I'm not going to go at length through each of those and and you know complain about uh, what's in there or what's lacking from there. But is it's pretty much the same thing in each of the different settings. You're given some races or species, I should say, not races, species. Uh, you're given some equipment. And you're given some adversaries. And, um, you, you know, I mean, like, they're, each of these only has, like, four different adversaries in it. And having experience with the system, uh, you know, myself, I'm not fussed about having to make up my own stuff in it because I'm familiar with the system. But if you're getting into this fresh with this, I would have much rather seen much more interesting adversaries or a better advice on why you're giving them certain abilities and why those work in the context of this skill system, right? Uh, or this particular game. Um, that's what you need for these types of generic games is to understand how the mechanics are going to affect the tone of the setting you're creating uh, at uh, at the table. Um, there's not an awful lot of that in here. And there's certainly no, as I said, there's no suggestions apart from species, no talents in any of them. Um, and that's a real, real disappointment uh, because yes, I can steal some ideas from Star Wars, which is great. You know, I, all my Star Wars books are totally compatible. Uh, it's very easy to steal monsters and adversaries and, uh, you know, talents and whatnot from there. But this is supposed to be a generic game, you know, and if I compare it to what the other generic games have on offer in their core books, there's way more in those. Now, in fairness to the game, this is a first edition of this. And if you compare the first edition of this to the first edition of Savage Worlds, or the first edition of GURPS, or the first edition of... Well, Cypher has just come out, so you can't really do it there. First edition of Hero, I suppose, like Champions. Um, then maybe it's going to fare more favorably. But the thing is, is that this is a game system that's been around for a, you know, a few years, and it's a quite popular game, too. I don't think it's a good enough excuse to say, well, grade us on the, you know, against the first, the older editions of these other games. I think that they should have learned from the mistakes of the other games and take some, stolen some ideas of what to include in the, in the core book um, for, for this one, uh, for their initial offering. So anyway, so the science fiction one, uh, science fiction one is, is geared towards uh, one of their intellectual properties as are most of the sample settings. So, it also, a more cynical reading of it would be that this is to interest you in what their other intellectual properties offer. The um, uh, fantasy setting is linked to their uh, rune, something or other, rune bound setting. Uh, the steampunk one, I believe, is not, it's not keyed to anything. It's brand new. Their weird wars one, which is like a World War II, but with, you know, uh, magic or weird science or like undead or aliens or whatever. Uh, it's linked to Tannhauser, another of their uh, board games. The science uh, fiction one is linked to Android, uh, their popular um, card game. And I believe it's a board game now too. Uh, Space Opera is linked to Twilight Imperium. So if you are fans of those properties, it's 
I imagine it's pretty badass. You've got some very, very, very bare bones rules to potentially explore those worlds with these rules. Um, so that's cool, you know, for, for you. Um, one species that I really did love, and I wish I saw they had included more of these, is in the uh, space opera setting, they give a um, psionic species. And what the psionic species has is a bunch of really cool, like it's what you would expect a telepath to be able to do. Their three abilities beyond like their stats and, and whatnot are mind reader, which is you can try and, you know, read someone's mind, mind shaper, which is where you can try and alter their emotional state uh, or mind breaker, where you're trying to will you know, break down their strain or their fatigue, you know, and not come unconscious. Um, that's awesome. Like the idea of a psychic character running around with the ability to do all those things automatically uh, is great. Again, I wish that they had given more options uh, for interesting uh, species that were like that because um, I don't recall anything as interesting coming from the uh, species in the Star Wars games. They were always really neat and had little neat twists to them, but nothing is as quite as, as uh, substantive as this. So that's pretty badass. Um, and I will steal that for uh, something down the road. Um, just to give you an idea too, like this is what the list of, of uh, equipment, these are the weapons from the uh, space opera setting. Uh, so you got a, a list of things that are like, you know, laser cannon, laser rifle, uh, plasma cannon, plasma rifle. Um, and then they give you a little list. Here's your extensive list of space opera armors here. So I keep washing out there, uh, folks. I, I apologize for that. Um, and as I said, like the stats are effectively the same as what they are in in each of the settings, you know, your heavy armor, your more defensive armor, your light armor is is kind of what you get. Uh, the game closes with the Game Master's Toolkit, which is uh, gives you ad advice on creating skills, creating species, creating talents. Now, the difficulty I have with this section is that it's a lot of, honestly, it's a lot of, it feels like it's a lot of hot air. There's not a lot of substance to it. There's not a lot of, here is the nitty gritty of how you can eyeball what a tier four talent would look like or a tier three talent would look like. There's vague generalities they talk about that, but there's not enough specifics. There is in, in the tier one, tier two. Um, and I can appreciate that the reason for that is because there isn't gonna be like the tier three, tier four, tier five abilities, the, the highest abilities you're gonna gain access to as a player those are going to be really game-breaking ones, and they're going to be really unique. Um, and they give a couple of examples in uh, in the talent section of it, but it's the unusual ones, the supernatural ones, are the ones that, and, and by supernatural, I mean both parahuman and like magical as well. The things that are going to be totally different, unique abilities, like I'm a uh, empath, uh, you know, or I'm a uh, medium. I can see spirits and interact with spirits, or I can, um, I don't know, like create fire or whatever. Um, I can change into an animal. Uh, those are the kind of things that I would like to see them give their thoughts on, here's what it is and here's why it should be in this tier and not the other tier. Uh, that's that's not in here. They don't even refer to the, the talents that they have in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the book as it is. So eh. um, they give some uh, suggestions on creating items, which really amounts to like, here's the cost of what each of these different attributes would be. So like, I want to build an armor that has plus three soak and plus three defense. That's going to cost me 3000, whatever, you know, whatever the the credits or dollars or whatever. Um, so it's, it's not great. It's sort of like a, a poor man's version of like the hero system where you're building everything with, you know, different points. Uh, there's some insight into creating an adversary. There are a couple optional rules, one of which I really love. Like there's one for Nemesis, which is, again, like the biggest, baddest kind of enemy your characters are going to fight. They give some rules for having them act on multiple turns. And that was something that was very, like sort of uh, referenced uh, in the Force and Destiny uh, rulebook as an optional way of treating Nemesis. Uh, but it was never actually a hard and fast rule. Um, in play, I can tell you that's a really, really great way of keeping your big bad enemy, your Darth Vader, you know, a, a meaningful presence in the game. Um, the let's see here. Then there's uh, some rules on item customization, which are pretty generic. And then the, it closes out with some rules. Oh, actually, I should say there's also rules for vehicles, creating vehicles, but there's very few examples again. 
Uh, then there's the rules for magic. So the rules for magic, the way that I read about them online was that they were going to be uh, something can, if you're not familiar with it, there is a system uh, called Wild Talents. It's the Or system, the one roll engine. Um, Wild Talents is a superhero role playing game created by, I believe, is Dennis uh, Detwiller. And uh, the way that you make your superhero, uh, your superpowers in that is there's very basic descriptions like attack, defend, move, and whatever. And then you add modifiers to that to tweak the base ability to be what you want it to be. And that's the way they describe magic in in uh, Genesis when they were doing their um, their uh, sort of advertising push. Um, that's not what it's turned out to be. Um, what you have is, I believe it's five or six spells. So there's attack, augment, barrier, conjure, curse, dispel, heal, and utility. Uh, utility is just generic, anything that doesn't fit in the other categories, and there's not really any hard and fast rules for it, so that's a little frustrating. Um, each of the other ones has a base effect, and then what you can do when you cast is you can choose to make the difficulty harder and add other effects to it. So, for instance, you could add, you know, a, a blast, it hit a bunch of different people to your attack spell, or you could add um, a paralyzing effect to your uh, curse spell. And what this means is um, basically the game uses the one axis, diff hard, you know, succeed, fail to model this, and it doesn't make any use of that second axis of advantage and disadvantage. The disadvantage is used to sort of model screw ups with your magic, uh, but it the advantage portion of it isn't used at all. So that to me is a real lost opportunity for such a cool mechanic that isn't in most other role playing games. Um, the other thing is, is there's no guidance whatsoever as to how to learn magic, apart from that you need the skill to get it. So there's nothing to suggest what considerations you should have to determine whether your magic casting uh, players can cast all of the spells, one of the spells, one specific version of the spells, or what. Uh, and fair enough, like, you know, it's a generic game, so you're going to make it, you know, uh, unique for each of your uh, settings, but every other generic role-playing game gives you at least some guidance on that in terms of like point cost or how you you know how you factor that. You know, like it's just it's at very best some rough ideas of how to do a magic system, but with no concrete application. So that's a bit disheartening. Also, I was just doing a mental exercise of other types of baseline abilities that I would that I, I can find in other generic games like Savage Worlds or GURPS or Hero uh, that I just, there's no way of doing them in this. And those include illusion, no illusion spells in this whatsoever, no movement spells, no fly, no teleport, no sprint, nothing about, there's no telekinesis, no moving things like moving earth, moving water, moving air, uh, moving objects, you know. Uh, no mind control or charm things. There's nothing that does that. Um, there's no element creation stuff apart from like special effects that you add to your attack spells. So there's no create fire, no create water, no create a breeze, anything like that. Um, and there's no transformation spells. No changing in yourself into an animal, no change yourself into whatever, you know, a door, a rock. No. Uh, so for a game like this, um, I would have expected, and uh, the way they described it, that it would be a very effects-driven um, mechanic for, for spells, so uh, to build your spells. So by that I mean, you know, what's important is what it does. Does it damage you? Does it transform you or whatever, rather than how it does it. The how it does it is some are trappings you can add as, uh, you know, a bit of narrative fluff, or you can add little, you know, mechanical modifiers. And they give you some good suggestions as to how to do that in here, like your attack spells, you know, you're uh, adding the fire uh, effect gives you, it makes it that you can burn. You can make people burn with it. So that's that's cool. Um, they also include a, a, a bit of a. It, it is a neat idea. It's a bit weird though, where magic implements uh, can be used to give you free effects on it. So like if you're using a magic orb, it can affect more targets more easily. Or if you're using a magic wand, it extends the distance. I mean, I'm confusing that with staff, but it's an interesting idea. But it's just such a weird little. Um, add-on, and it's so subjective, like that doesn't rely on any other kind of established role-playing game tropes, 
So it's just a weird little bit of mechanical bits that's put in there. But yeah, I mean, so that's that's the magic system. And that is the only supernatural power system that's in the game. Um, any kind of, if you wanted to run a campaign that has any kind of supernatural abilities, you're going to build those as uh, as spells. And you are left to your own devices to figure out how your characters gain access to it, whether they just have to get a spell or a skill, or whether you're going to add a talent. Um, you're going to have to come up with how many of the spells they get, whether they get, they can freely, you know, make any kind of a spell they want, or whether you're going to restrict them to, here's a fire, you know, uh, I'll build my firebolt spell as an attack with the burning option. So a fire spell you can learn, and it'll give you a two purple difficulty. Um, but it's, all on you as the DM uh, to come up with that. There's no samples of how to implement that in any of the campaigns. Uh, it also includes some hacking rules, which I imagine we'll see a lot of use in the Android uh, game. These seem very similar to the um, hacking rules from the Star Wars uh, supplements. So uh, if you are familiar with those, then um, you'll know what you're, you're getting into. Um, and then finally, there are the tones that I mentioned before. So what the tones are is supposed to be like a small mechanical modifier or a set of sub rules that will twist your the the rules, the underlying you know mechanics to fit your setting a little better or fit the the feeling in the in the game. Uh, the tones that are in here are horror, uh, mystery, pulp, romance, and drama, and superheroes. The horror one just introduces fear rules, which you would uh, expect from the um, you know the horror setting, uh, and they're uh, perfectly functional. There's nothing that's spectacular about them that's different from every other set of fear rules, you know, that are in Call of Cthulhu or you know GURPS or Savage Worlds or anything like that. Um, they introduce sanity uh, as well, uh, which is a you know again a recurring Lovecraftian kind of theme. So that's cool. They've got that here. Um, oh, Intrigue is another one, too. Um, intrigue gives a, one little minor rule uh, addition, which is you can make, it's called a major revelation. Um, it's basically an, a way of, uh, let's see here, it gives you upgrades uh, related to the revelation. So it's sort of like a flashback scene, I guess, is how it would play the table. And then it gives you a mechanical upgrade for that, and everyone can do that once per, uh, uh, per session. Um, Mystery doesn't add anything. Pulp doesn't add anything. Oh, Pulp does. Pulp adds the cliffhanger. And it's a neat idea where you just blow all your story points to save someone from, you know, save someone's bacon. And they didn't die. They just, you know, there was some uh, excuse as to why they survived that that uh, drama. They, they got knocked off the side by the, you know, cybernetic ape. Uh, and the dice came out that they died. They went falling. They missed their climbing check. So someone uses the cliffhanger rule to blow uh, their uh, half their story points, and instead the character is hanging on by his fingernails on the edge of the um, you know on the edge of the ledge. So that, that's kind of cool. I like that. Uh, and I uh, I don't know how much that will matter because that will depend on how big the pool of story points is. If there's only one there. It's not a meaningful uh, expense for the players. But if it's if they got a really big story pool where they're sitting on a bunch of points, then yeah, that's a that's a significant purchase. So I don't know if that one was necessarily thought through terribly well. Um, the romance and drama rules, I haven't read those because I will never run a romance campaign. Uh, and then there's the superheroes. And I've already sort of shared my my thoughts on the superhero one. I just, I feel like, like a lot of generic role-playing games feel the need to include uh, lip service or rule support for superheroes rules, uh, superhero play. Uh, and it's just not necessary because there are some games that just don't fit that. You know, and at the very least, it's possible that this could totally emulate the um, a superhero setting with different modifications to the mechanics. But the ones that are included in the book are certainly not enough. And even to the point that, I mean, if, why bother including a tone for superheroes when you don't have any hard and fast power rules in here? All you've got is spells. And there are noticeable absences like the movement things. You can build, yeah, sure, you can use the spells to uh, try, try and cobble together an idea of how a superhero would work in uh, in Genesis, but you won't be able to fly. You won't be able to swing really fast. You won't be able to run really fast. Like, it's just, it's it's not there yet. So, um, I made some notes here, so I'm just going to go through. that. That's sort of what's in the book, and I know this 
likely sounds like I'm just ragging on this game and ragging on this game and ragging on this game. And uh, I, I really, uh, I my frustration comes with I think the the uh, expectations that I had with this game uh, uh, because the Star Wars game is so well done and has you know every supplement has great material in it, setting material, uh, kind of metagame material and crunch material. Um, this is just so falls so short of that level of quality um, for a game that is building itself as a generic game this falls well short um, what this is is a setting free version of the mechanics that drive the Star Wars game with some interesting tidbits that you could take as a DM and do work on it to call to create your own setting but you're going to need to feel comfortable with eyeballing difficulties and things like that. Like you're going to have to do a lot of work yourself uh, to to make the final product, um, or have some very very um, understanding and uh, reasonable players. Uh, you know, one interesting way you could use this would be to uh, to create like say a fantasy setting and then just decide with your players how you're going to manage spells, how you're going to manage um, the different races and things like that how you're going to cost different talents. Uh, that might be an interesting exercise, but in terms of pickup and play, whew, unless you're trying to run some kind of just modern day thing without a lot of complications, uh, you probably have enough rules in here to add some aliens in, uh, maybe some monsters, but it would be difficult to run any kind of substantial uh, campaign where your characters have any kind of supernatural or quasi supernatural abilities because there's just not enough in here to to do that. Uh, or even enough to give you guidance as to how to do that. Um, what else? I'm trying to think here of, of anything else that I uh, uh, I had to uh, to say about it. You know what? What this? Here, wait, here's something else. I, I guess I thought of is if this book had another hundred pages, uh, I bet you it would have been a much better product. If we they had a hundred pages to include more examples, uh, clear examples of the mechanics. Uh, of the adapting the system to the different settings uh, and to fleshing out the spell system. Uh, even if they gave, you know, two pages to two different ways of doing it, like saying, hey, you want to run a sci-fi thing with psychics in it? Here's how you use the spell rules to build psychic abilities, and here's how you would cost them in terms of either experience, flat experience points, or as tiered abilities. Uh, and here's how you would do it as spells in a fantasy setting. Um, or here's how you would model them as weirdo, you know, pulp powers in a 30s cliffhangers type uh, game. Um, but that's not in here, you know. Uh, and the reason I fault the game for not having it is because most other multi-genre, you know, generic role-playing games has that stuff. I feel like if they had sat down and done a list of, here's what's in our competitors' books, Let's make sure we at least hit these categories in there and, and done that. Uh, this could have been a really superior product. Uh, but as it stands right now, it's just like the, you know, the illustrations are. It is an incomplete picture of what could be a really engaging, uh, engaging game. So is this a game for you? Um, at the time of recording, this is the only thing that is out, as well as the uh, dice. And I don't think there's anything on the horizon for this either. There's a bunch of uh, Star Wars books out for it. You can always easily adapt, but if you're going to do that, why not just buy the Star Wars books? Then all the work of trimming it to the setting is done for you. Um, if you already are invested deeply in the Star Wars games, or you're familiar with the... Um, uh, you're comfortable with finding additional material online that may not be playtested or may just be all over the place. Uh, you can, you know, you probably could can make do with this game as is. You're going to be doing a, you're going to be doing a lot of making up stuff. Uh, if you want to do anything apart from either a very low magic kind of fantasy setting or a modern day setting without a lot of, um, you know, a lot of supernatural stuff in it, um, a you know, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen style thing, um, playing the, you know, the heroes from 80s action films would be awesome with the system. I think you could build a Jack McClain, you could build, or John McClain, you could build a, uh, uh, what the hell's his name from um, 
uh, Big Trouble, uh, Jack Burton from uh, Big Trouble in Little China. You could build the Karate Kid. Uh, actually, you probably couldn't build the Karate Kid because the unarmed combat rules are, are not particularly fleshed out in here. Um, if you are someone who really loves and are very comfortable with the Star Wars mechanic, but you want to try something different, like an Old West game or something like that, this would be a really easy transition. And it would be a lot easier than trying to rejig all the stuff in Star Wars to fit that type of setting. Um, I will be very interested in seeing where they go with this game. You know, um, this is the first bare bones game of it. And again, like if I compare this to the first edition of Savage Worlds, the first edition of Savage Worlds, to be honest, was, was garbage. Like there was barely enough information in there to run a no fantasy or no magic kind of fantasy type setting. It was only through iterations of the game and through supplements coming out that they stole ideas from that we got to the, to the polished and comprehensive game that we, we have now. So I can see that down the road. Um, even if they did a companion that just added a bunch of more substantive examples of how to you know, work the mechanics or twist the mechanics to make uh, different settings work, that would be awesome. Uh, because, like I said at the outset, the, the dice mechanic for this game is really, really fun. It's one of the best that I've... Uh, one of the best ones I've had at my table, you know? I mean, it's... Um, it really gets the players excited about, you know, coming up with interesting interpretations of the dice rolls. And uh, and as a DM, it's exciting as hell because I keep saying exciting. It's dynamic. I'll, I'll switch up my, my uh, descriptors here. It's dynamic because you can have these unexpected things that come up. You know, one of the funniest parts in one of our Star Wars games was when one player set up that he was going to, you know, show off to another player about his crazy piloting. And you're about to go, you know, very slowly into this giant asteroid where the space station was. And he turns around and is like, I'm going to go in as fast as I can and showboat. And then he rolled two despairs. So basically our scene cut from that to inside the asteroid where we heard this very slowly getting louder. And then we saw the ship come flying out with flames coming behind it because he'd smashed his way through the thing. That's the kind of fun twists that happen in the course of the uh, narrative that come from this narrative, from this dice mechanic. And I really would like to see what else they do with it. So unless you are very familiar with the setting and you're dying to run something that is does not require a lot of supernatural abilities um, uh, with the Star Wars mechanic, then yes, this is the game for you. If you don't want to do that, I would suggest waiting until one of the setting books comes out and see what the implementation of these bare bones looks like, you know, how they twist the spells, how they twist the, the talent mechanics to fit specific ideas. Um, I suppose as well, if you are a hardcore kludger, you really want to, you know, put together some fan material and, and do that, fill your boots. There's certainly enough starting point here to do that. Uh, there's not any guidance for it. There's not any mechanical suggestions for it, but, this would be a better template to work from than what one of the Star Wars books would have been because you have to always jettison the Star Wars-y aspects of it uh, before you started uh, you know, down the path that you wanted to go towards. So anyway, um, so that's my um, really rocky take through Genesis. Uh, as I said from the outside, I was very, very excited for this. And part of um, my, part of the, the, the criticism may be from the, you know, disappointed uh, perspective that I'm, I'm viewing this game. Um, but I am hopeful that it does well enough to merit some supplements because given the strength of the other products that Fantasy Flight has put out for all the other games that I've collected, they've always been amazing. So uh, I will be interested in seeing where they go with this afterwards. So um, if, however, if you're a Savage Worlds player who's on the fence, uh, whether to sw swap over to this and give it a try, I'd suggest waiting until the next supplement comes out. Stick with Savage Worlds for now. If you're a GURPS player and you want to have something more um, cinematic uh, and you don't like the some of the swingier aspects of Savage Worlds, you could give us a try for specific settings, but you know, uh, bear in mind my concerns uh, or my, my sort of uh, comments with respect to the, the lack of support for certain um, things. Uh, if you are a Cypher player uh, and want to try something different, I think that the, the dice mechanic itself would be a, a neat enough change. Um, 
it, it gives the players some really interesting narrative input into a game without having to, you know, rely on a on the the d20, which can be a very, you know, swinging kind of uh, of dice. So, um, yeah, the first thing I'm going to try with this game because I'm certainly not giving up on it. I mean, like I I uh, I would like to see it at the table before I I um, I reserve final judgment, and I'm certainly going to pick up whatever products they put out for it. So. Uh, I, I will look forward to seeing um, how they think the system should work, but I think I'm going to try a uh, psychic spiritualist kind of um, uh, Victorian thing, uh, so I can use the psychic uh, species mix, mixed with some of the modern stuff that's reskinned to be more Victorian 19th century era stuff, uh, or I'm going to really dig deep and um, I am planning a session for my son where we're going to be playing effectively characters from the destiny role-playing or destiny video game. He's, he's a big fan of that. So that is a very little elements of superheroes, little elements of um, uh, like gear driven um, uh, uh, looting, like from, from uh, multiplayer uh, online games uh, and uh, modern sci-fi action stuff. And I don't know how well it's going to work, but, I'm going to maybe try that because I think it, that would be a good way of testing, seeing how hard it is to create balanced stuff without guidance from the, from the rule book. But anyway, that's, that's what I'm planning to do with it. Uh, so um, that is my very long review of, um, of Genesis. Uh, this is only an initial um, uh, assessment. So maybe, uh, you know, once I've played, I may change my opinion. Uh, if you have uh, any thoughts on this, uh, if I'm way out to lunch, or if I've got something totally wrong with the rule book, uh, please uh, do not hesitate to co uh, correct me in the um, comment section below. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns regarding it to uh, my review, please, again, don't hesitate to put something below, and I will endeavor to respond in a timely fashion. Um, otherwise, uh, thanks so much for viewing. Uh, I hope that this has uh, helped you decide whether this is the game for you, uh, or if or not. Um, I guess the final thing I should say, I don't regret buying this. I'm glad I've gone through this, but I, as you can tell, I'm a bit of a hoarder, so you might want to, uh, unless you're similarly inclined, uh, you may want to wait and see what, what comes out in the wash. But anyway, I have a DD and d session to prep for tonight, so I will cut this off here and get some food in my craw, so I'm not a hangry uh, DM, but uh, thanks as well for, uh, for listening, and uh, I uh, happy gaming uh, to y'all.